Well, uh, hi and welcome everyone to this session. Uh, what's new in Gradualizer? Uh, gradually typing in Elixir and uh, Erlang with uh, uh, Radek Shimchishin. Uh, we're really glad, uh, glad you're here with us, uh, Radek. And without any further ado, over to you, Radek. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, so uh, I will talk about uh, what's new in Gradualizer and about gradually typing um, Erlang and Elixir. Okay, so what's the agenda gonna look like? Uh, first, I'll introduce myself. Then I will talk a little bit about what gradual typing is and how it uh, fits uh, in the picture of strong typing, weak typing, dynamic and static. Uh, then I will talk about the approaches to gradually typing Erlang and Elixir about what's new and actually since when uh, it's uh, new because uh, the tools I'm going to talk about are still in development, so they change quite frequently. But the meat of the presentation is going to be the demo or two demos, uh, one with uh, Elixir and Gradient and the other one with uh, Gradualizer and the Erlang language server. And then I will finish with some practical tips. And I'm happy to answer some questions uh, throughout the session. And we can have a bit longer uh, discussion at the end. So uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Radek Shumchushin. Uh, you can find me uh, under the Ersh handle or nickname on GitHub, Medium, or Twitter. I'm a tech lead at Erlang Solutions, uh, specifically the crack of office for Erlang Solutions. Uh, I have been working at the company for uh, almost uh, 11 years now. Uh, I'm a static type system enthusiast, and I'm saying enthusiast because I don't have a professional background uh, developing type systems or uh, academic schooling in that. But in general, I have a Master of Science, Computer Science background. So uh, I think it's a good foundation to, to deal with these topics. Uh, and I'm contributing uh, to Gradualizer as a core uh, team member. And I'm also a co-creator of Gradient, uh, which is an Elixir frontend to Gradualizer. Uh, I also believe that sleek and good quality docs make an, the programming language community and ecosystem um, easier to approach, easier to start uh, learning and start contributing. And that's why I co-authored uh, Erlang Enhanced Proposal 48 and also implemented that as part of uh, eDoc, which is part of Erlang LTP 24. And this was the groundwork for using the Elixir X doc to generate uh, sleek and modern docs for Erlang projects. Uh, and I'm also an instant messaging expert, uh, an XMPP engineer, uh, Mangus IM, uh, XMPP server, core team member, who I'm recently not very active on that, uh, on that front. And in general, I'm an Erlang and Elixir uh, programmer professionally. So more on the topic of this uh, talk, what is gradual typing? Let's, let's start with this uh, simple diagram. And um, obviously it, it might be a bit biased, um, but the point here is not to uh, classify and argue about which language should be in each in which uh, part of the diagram, but to think about how we can uh, how we can classify or what are the uh, angles or the axes on which we can classify programming languages. So let's think of two um, axes: uh, weak typing and strong typing being one of them, and dynamic versus static being the other one. So. For some examples, uh, how can a strong type system look like? Uh, a perfect example of that is OCaml, which uh, has a very strong type system, which is very explicit, but sometimes clunky. So examples of statically typed programming languages are Haskell, OCaml, f -sharp, Scala, to some extent, uh, C++. 
and what's on the other end of uh, of this uh, axis so if we have static then uh, we also have dynamic so how do these programs differ or programming languages differ so uh, in this case a program does not have type annotations but uh, if it's a strongly typed language then data has well-defined types so it's impossible to do invalid operations uh, but if it's impossible, there has to be a check done at some point. And in these dynamically typed languages, this check is done at runtime. So just before an operation is uh, carried out, it's checked whether it's a, a legal operation or uh, not a legal one. So for example, uh, in languages like this, it's not possible to add an integer in a string because this results in a runtime exception being thrown. And this might happen idly when we test the program, but sometimes it might happen uh, as late as production, uh, which is mm, pretty bad. So what are the pros uh, of these languages? They are usually more flexible uh, because there are no type checks, there are no compile time checks. So we can just pass data around where we need it. Uh, and this uh, leads to a flatter learning curve. Uh, but there are also some disadvantages to this. Uh, for example, it may be harder to navigate code because we sometimes deep uh, in, in some code, we are not really sure what code we, uh, sorry, what data uh, we work with. So are these uh, numbers, strings, uh, yeah, some hash maps uh, or, or more complex data structures? So the APIs are less defined. We also have to test such uh, programs uh, way more and achieve a uh, very high coverage to have confidence in, in, the, in the logic of the program. And there's also a performance penalty because uh, the checks are done at uh, runtime, uh, they slow down the program a little bit. And examples of such languages are um, Erlang, Elixir, Python, JavaScript or PHP in Lua and, and more. So let's see an example of how a dynamically checked uh, program language looks like. Here we have a snippet of Python where we define uh, a Lambda function or a closure which accepts a parameter. And we immediately apply number three to that closure. And because this uh, in disclosure uh, just adds the parameter to a constant two, this evaluates the five. But if we try to apply a string value, so the string A, we get an error thrown at runtime. And this is how the error is reported. That's type error, type must be string, not int. Uh, in the case of a statically uh, typed programming language like Haskell, when we define uh, something similar, so a lambda function which accepts a parameter a and adds this parameter a to a mm, string with the number two, if we try to apply uh, an integer to that uh, function, uh, this program simply will not compile and we, we will get a very specific error. So. It's not possible to run it. There is no space for runtime exceptions. We'll get uh, this feedback at compile time. So way, way earlier. So there is no risk of uh, production issues. So we see some benefits of both approaches, dynamic and static. We also see some deficiencies of both approaches. So why not uh, try merging both or taking the best of both of these? And this actually has been tried uh, multiple times uh, in programming language history for different programming languages and also uh, using different theoretical methods. So gradual typing is one of these approaches. Mm, but uh, we can also find the, the notion of optional typing in uh, literature, which was not as strictly defined formally. But uh, 
the, the practical implementations uh, of gradual typing uh, defined by Jeremy Seek and, and Wally Taha are, for example, TypeScript and the Flow for JavaScript, MyPy for Python or TypeTrackit, probably the best, uh, the best or the earliest example of uh, this of gradual typing in practice. Hack from Facebook for PHP and also uh, Gradualizer for Erlang and Gradient uh, for now Gradient for Elixir. And when we talk about optional typing, it's uh, it also requires underlining that there is a well, uh, well-known and quite widely practiced uh, use of type specs, which were popularized by uh, Dialyzer, uh, developed by Tobias Lindahl and Kostis Sagonas. Uh, and thanks to that, Erlang programs, hmm, which used to look like uh, on this uh, slide, now quite often look more like uh, on this slide. So we have the type information, we have the better defined uh, APIs. But could we use these uh, types and function specifications uh, more effectively? So the advantages of gradual typing are that we can move between a completely dynamic program, so like this one, to a statically type check program with like this one, uh, but not do it uh, all in one go. So we don't have to specify the entire program to reap the benefits of using the type checker. So we can add the types and specs as needed, for example, uh, as a team upskills and learns uh, new techniques, or as project grows, more people are uh, added to the team, uh, or uh, it's, it matures uh, and there are more and more APIs and we want to make them easier to navigate. And also when quality becomes more and more important because it, it's not a prototype, uh, or not a prototype anymore. It has to actually work under a lot of different circumstances in, in production. So another aspect of gradual typing is that some parts of the program are checked statically, the ones that have type specs. Uh, the rest is still checked dynamically at runtime and it can benefit from the let it crash philosophy from the supervision uh, trees uh, restarting uh, parts of the program, et cetera, et cetera. So we go, we do away with the all or nothing approach that it's either, either all type uh, checked and, and annotated or it's none and it might all crash uh, if we don't test uh, extensively. Okay, so now that we know uh, a little bit about the approach in, in theory, uh, we can have a look at uh, the practical implementation for uh, Erlang. And this is Gradualizer. This is a gradual type checker created by Josef Svenningson and first introduced at uh, Codebeam uh, Stockholm. And the assumptions are that we can start with writing dynamic Erlang as usual. Uh, and that message passing will always be dynamically typed. So Gradualizer does not use uh, any mechanisms to, uh, to type check this part of our programs. Mm, static typing is, uh, is opt-in. So it only happens when we add a type spec to a particular function. Without a type spec, there is no check happening. Uh, so we can add the specs only where uh, we feel it's appropriate. And then we just run the type checker and profit from the box code and uh, from, from the feedback we get from it, all that before runtime. And in general, the tool is uh, still experimental, but it's uh, constantly improving. And on the right-hand side, we have uh, the, the list of uh, top contributors uh, to the project. Uh, a little bit about the theoretical underpinnings. So 
there is no global type inference in gradualizer, um, but there is a mechanism called bidirectional typing used, which uh, relies or incorporates a limited local type inference, and the amount of, the amount of type inference can be controlled with the infer uh, flag passed uh, on the command line. Uh, there is also pattern type inference, and there is uh, limited type refinement based on pattern matches, or actually mismatches and um, guards. And here is an example of uh, type checking a very simple Erlang program with Gradualizer. Uh, so we define a simple function taking two integer parameters that um, just adds, adds them. We also define a print function, which doesn't have a spec, which is fine because it's gradual typing. We don't have to add a spec uh, everywhere. Uh, and we define a test function that uh, misapplies uh, the add function to two different uh, arguments because one of them is not an integer. And then we run the type checker on this uh, module and we immediately get feedback that the string on line eight uh, is expected to have type integer, but it has type string and the, the error is uh, highlighted or underlined. So it's, uh, it's very similar to the uh, Haskell example. And I would like to uh, introduce a gradient, which uh, aims to do uh, something very similar for Elixir. Uh, basically, it's a front end to Gradualizer, which uh, allows to use the tool for Elixir programs. And kind of, uh, it's the glue between the Elixir code and the Erlang syntax tree that's actually produced by the Elixir compiler and also is used by Gradualizer to do its type checking. Uh, but Gradient is not just that, it's also a little bit of uh, macro magic to provide more type checked or a bit better type checked uh, frameworks. Uh, all the assumptions are very similar uh, to Gradualizer's. The tool is created uh, mostly by uh, me and Przemek Wojtasik, a colleague from the Krakow office of Erlang Solutions. And it's also experimental, but it's uh, constantly improving. And here is an example of using a uh, gradient with uh, some Elixir code. The code is exactly the same as with Erlang, so we have an add function taking two integers. Uh, we run a mixed task, mixed gradient, and we get the feedback that the bit expression line seven is expected to have type integer and it's underlined in the error is underlined in red. So that's it for the introduction uh, of the tools. Uh, now I would like to very quickly go over the features that were uh, added since the last approximately uh, half a year. So it's exhaustiveness uh, checking of non trivial types. It's uh, type checking of maps and therefore Elixir tracts. It's uh, exhaustiveness checking of map variants. So this is uh, connected with the first point, uh, but it was uh, quite uh, a different chunk of uh, development. It's property-based testing of the type checker to, uh, well, squash as many bugs as possible and make it uh, robust. Uh, which also led to the discovery of some infinite loops and uh, fixing them. There is also a gradualizer diagnostic for the Erlang language server, which uh, makes uh, gradualizer feedback immediately available in the editor of your choice. And many, many, many bug fixes. So uh, I won't go uh, over all of this in detail. Uh, at this point, because I really want to focus more on the live demo, which uh, I will switch to uh, now. And are there any questions at this point? Uh, 
I guess and, that's. Yeah, there's uh, nothing in the Q and A box. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you. So, uh, I hope you can see the screen uh, clearly and specifically if the font is uh, big enough. If, if not, please let me know. So, on the left hand side, we have an example Elixir module, and let's try type checking it. Okay, so I ran gradient type check file on this module and it returned okay. So it means that the code mm, type checks properly. So uh, this code describes a gen server, which is uh, an implementation of a simple server handling two, two kinds of messages. One of them is an echo request. So uh, the server should receive a message and then just echo it back to the sender. And the other request is a hello request. So the server should just uh, receive a request of this type and uh, then print the, the name uh, or, well, the payload of this uh, request, but it doesn't send anything back. And the idea here is to make this, this message passing interface, not only the function interface, but also the message passing interface uh, explicit. So how can we do it? How can we leverage the type checker and type system to do it? Uh, we define the message type, uh, which is a union or a, some type of uh, these two aforementioned requests. And uh, Let's see if uh, the type checker and this definition can guide us somehow on uh, working on this code. So for example, we know that the type checks at this point, but what if we change this definition to something uh, different? Uh, let's say I remove the hello request and let's type check again right now. And we get the error that the clause on line 63 cannot be reached. So let's uh, check line 63. And we see that this is the implementation of handle call, uh, the gen server uh, behavior callback for uh, a tagged tuple with the hello tag and a name. So, okay, we declared that the type of our uh, handled messages is just the echo request. But here we have code for a different request. So, okay, we, like we have dead code, it's never gonna be used. So let's comment it out and the uh, type check now. Okay, it's good, we fixed uh, the bug. So let's uh, try again with uh, the expanded version of this type. So this is exactly the same as uh, the first definition, but here we just expand the types to their definitions instead of using uh, references to remote types. And let's type check at this point. And we get the warning that not exhaustive patterns on line 58. And the example value is hello. So let's jump to line 58. And indeed, here is the implementation of the handle call function for the echo request, but we are missing the implementation for the hello request, which is now part of the declared uh, messaging API. So. Okay, let's let's fix that and bring this code back and type check now and back to normal. Uh, we declare that we handle two different requests and we have to handle them because otherwise we get uh, as, uh, an error reported. So uh, how how else can we use this uh, mechanism? Like. Let's let's try what happens when I do a silly mistake, like I do echo rec instead of uh, echo rec tag. And let's run the type checker now. So we get the warning that the pattern echo rex on line 58 doesn't have the type message. And indeed, because type message defines an echo rec uh, type. So let's fix that. Type check one more time and it's good. So what do we get? We get dead code detection uh, if we declare 
in the message uh, less types of requests that the implementation does. Uh, we get warnings about missing code and we get warnings about uh, silly typos and issues when we uh, implement a handler for a message that doesn't exist. So, uh, so far so good. It uh, seems pretty useful. So let's uh, go to the top uh, of this module and look at the eco API function. This function is exported to the users of, uh, of the module and of the server. So, uh, so far we looked at how the type checker can help us when we implement the logic of the server, but can it also help us on the side of the caller process? So before we actually make the call to the server and Yes, it can in some way. Let's let's uh, see how. So we know that to call the server, we use the gen server call. Uh, let's uh, check this functions documentation. But we know that this function uh, returns a value of type term, which is the most general uh, value that exists. It can be anything. There is no information about that. So for example, if we wanted to pattern match on this value, because we know that an echo response will be something different than a hello response, uh, or that there might be different uh, echo responses based on the state of the server, we might want to pattern match on that or mm, and do something with the response afterwards. But since the gen server call returns a type, sorry, a term of uh, type of this type, the upper general one, um, the type checker cannot help us. So we have to we have to help the type checker help us in this pattern matching. And we do it by using the annotate type macro where we just do the call as usual. And then we also pass information about the return type of the scope. And thanks to this, we reap the benefits uh, of uh, the type checker. So for example, let's try what happens when I do a silly mistake like this we get the, the feedback similar to the previous one that uh, the pattern echo uh, rsz on line 30 doesn't have the expected type. So that's uh, nice. Let's fix that, check again, back to normal. So this syntax might uh, look a bit heavy. So we can also do it like this to make it more similar to uh, ordinary uh, elixir. So the annotation can come uh, last and the value being piped into it. Or we can uh, completely get rid of the explicit annotation and just uh, use an auxiliary function like this uh, for the same effect. So let's see what happens uh, when we do it like this. Uh, and let's actually introduce a, a bug. Okay, this worked. So, uh, what's the difference, and why do we why do we even need it? Uh, so, annotate type doesn't do anything at runtime. Like it, it's a no-op. It just takes the value of that we pass to it, and it returns it back. But it embeds this type information into the abstract syntax tree of the compiled module, so the type checker can use it. Uh, for its reasoning about this uh, case expression. And if we don't want to use the annotation, but we are uh, more happy about the auxiliary function, this information is simply passed in the spec of this auxiliary function. So we, we need to pass this uh, to the type checker because otherwise it just won't know uh, the type of, of this value of this uh, response. So sorry to interrupt, just letting you know there's about 10 minutes remaining. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions at this point? Yes, we do have two questions in the in the QA box. 
Okay. So I'll read uh, the first one. Uh, so we got a question from, sorry if I pronounced it wrong, but uh, Jason Han. That some of the gradual type checkers are a little smoother gradual typing, so just having an option such as minus minus strict. What do you think about this approach? Mm, so I'm not sure what the what the meaning of this option would be, mm, but I think that one one option that's pretty similar in gradualizer is the infer option, and uh, like it's it's a bit more strict in the default mode. And when we enable the infer option, it will try to tell the type of more uh, more terms, more things in our program. So I think that it might be a little bit uh, related, but maybe not exactly the same thing. Yeah, okay, thank you for the question. So before answering more questions, uh, I would like to go to the next uh, part of the demo. Uh, to stage two. And here I would like to ask uh, ourselves the question like, how can we use the type checker to do a little bit more? How else can it help us? And one of the ideas is that, that in the Erlang virtual machine or in the Elixir uh, runtime, we have a lot of concurrent processes. Uh, we have uh, multiple servers running, uh, but there are different kinds of servers like one of them accepts different messages than another one. And one of the possible mistakes is that we send a message of a certain type uh, to a server, which just, or a process, which just doesn't handle it. And it will lead to a bug uh, in production. It will lead to a bug, uh, a bug in runtime uh, or even a crash at runtime. So uh, let's try to run an example and see uh, how it works. Okay. Oh, sorry, I was to run the example and I run the type checker. So I run some code, uh, the code of a test. And now I will uncomment a line that I think will lead to an error. And then I'll run it again, and then we'll go over the code of this test. And yes, something else is happening. And like, it seems that the, this got blocked. And yeah, after a while, we got a runtime error that gen server call timed out. So, uh, well, this is definitely not something we like to happen in production. So let's look at the code uh, to see uh, why it's happened. So we create two types of, of uh, processes. One is of our particular uh, server type. So we create it with server start link. And the other is just a, a random process that does, that does something completely different than our particular server. And when we use the server API to call uh, our server process, uh, it responds with, uh, with the expected thing. So it just returns uh, the payload. But if we use the server API to call a random process, like just in some arbitrary process, uh, well, we see what happened on the right hand side. The, the server, uh, the, sorry, the request timed out because the server cannot handle it. And we would like to avoid it. So let's see what happens when we run the type checker on this code uh, right now. And we get a warning that the variable on the variable PID on line 103 is expected to have, to have type T, not just the arbitrary uh, or the general type PID. And so we get feedback, that, uh, sorry, we cannot use the server uh, API with any process, with any PID. We have to pass a PID of this particular type. And how is it, uh, how does the type checker know that? So. When you jump to the top of the server definition, we define a type T, which is actually equivalent to a PID 
but it exists as its own type, a type of this particular server. And then all the API functions uh, accept only this type T or return this type T instead of a PID. So when we start link, we return okay T or already started T. Uh, the echo function only accepts the type T. The uh, auxiliary function called echo also only does uh, that. And uh, all the rest of this example is the same as the previous one. Uh, but we see that uh, thanks to explicitly defining the type for our process, we can avoid the API of this uh, of the server being misused with bits of a different process. So another win. We know this. Uh, we type check the code, and we know upfront before running it that uh, we misuse the APIs. And I will quickly jump back to the next example without asking for questions at this time. Because uh, one of the things that Robert Birding, one of the creators of uh, Erlang, pointed out when I was showing this, uh, this demo to him that we could actually generate these auxiliary functions. And it was obvious, immediately obvious to him, uh, but it took me a while to, to figure out how to do it. Uh, but Indeed, it's, it's possible. So we don't have to implement this function ourselves. Uh, we can use some macro magic that's provided by Gradient to generate them. And this function is actually uh, generated to be exactly the same as this uh, example here. So uh, we don't have to uncomment this code uh, for our server to run and to type check. So let's see if it type checks. And indeed, we got an OK. So how is it possible uh, that this code is uh, generated? And is there anything uh, else uh, that we can benefit from? So it can be generated because instead of using a gen server reply, uh, we use a type server reply. And as in the previous example, we used uh, we passed the type of the response in the annotation or in the auxiliary functions uh, spec. Here we use type server reply and we pass the type of the response. So we have more locality because this type uh, is type of this expression. So it's less possible that we make a mistake given the value and the type are uh, on the same line. And moreover, uh, thanks to using uh, the same macro or these two things being arguments of the same macro, uh, this is, it's not possible to actually do a typo or provide an invalid value, a value that's not of this type here, because if we do it, we will get a warning that uh, the variable in line 71 is expected to have type uh, contract echo response, but it has type echo res z, and we get it uh, highlighted. So not only we can generate the auxiliary function, but we also get type checking on uh, the response. So uh, let's fix it. And that's it for this example. I have one more uh, thing that I would like to show, but uh, this time we'll jump from the Elixir world to the uh, Erlang world. And here I would like to show the integration between uh, Gradualizer running in the background and Erlang language server, which gives us uh, feedback. And this is a different code. I won't go into the details about what this code implements, but I will run the type checker on it just to see uh, what we get. Okay, so there is definitely some some errors uh, in this code. So let's just uh, let's just browse this and see how the integration with uh, Erlang server works. Okay, so for example, here we get a warning and that the pattern var doesn't have the type ABS something something. So let's, let's scroll more. Uh, that's the operator. 
uh, plus is expected to have a different type. Uh, okay, so that's how the feedback is displayed in, in the editor. And again, we see the information that pattern var does not have the type something something. So, okay, there, there seems to be a repetitive warning about the pattern var. So let's search for this pattern in this code. Like I uh, highlight var and okay, it's we found the definition of type term, which has quite a lot of variants, like uh, probably 15 or maybe in 20 of them. And one of them is commented out. Uh, so, uh, okay, let's let's go back to one of these reported errors and comment this out. Uh, and yeah, we we like we fixed the error. Uh, at least we think so, uh, because it's not displayed anymore. But now, when we change the type definition uh, and go back to to that place, we get a different error that in the place where we first try to fix the issue, we got feedback that there are non-exhaustive patterns, that the pattern var is never matched. So we see how, we see live feedback about how uh, our types and our implementation uh, mismatches if it's the case. And it's quite easy for it to mismatch if we operate on types that have like uh, 20 different variants. So, Live feedback in uh, Gradualizer also seems to be, uh, from Gradualizer in an editor also seems to be pretty useful. And I would like to stop demoing now and go back to the last slide with a few closing remarks. Uh, like, I think it's worth to leverage the tools as much as possible. So use the Erlang language server for live feedback in the editor. Uh, use the compiler options like warm missing spec and warm missing spec all so that because the more specs we have, the bigger confidence in the code we can get. Uh, there is no Elixir language server integrate integration available yet for gradient, but uh, fingers crossed, we're going to get there. And we could see how using these tools, leveraging these tools, we could do a bit more type-driven development by describing, describing our domain with uh, data types, writing the implementation, letting the type checker find bugs, and not necessarily test everything, even the trivial uh, parts of the program. And it also uh, helps us with aggressive refactoring when once we have the domain described with types, but we have to extend this description and we have to modify the type definitions, uh, or a function spec, we just run the type checker and let it figure out what else has to change in the program to match these uh, changes in, in the domain uh, model. However, the tools are still a bit experimental. So uh, if there is suspicious code or suspicious warnings or some warning is not clear, it's worth writing a test. And if you happen to find any issues like this, uh, please do report them um, on the respective uh, project sites on GitHub, so Gradualizer or Gradient. And uh, that's it. Thanks for joining. So, well, thank you so much uh, uh, for joining us, everyone. And thank you, Radit, for sh sharing your experience with us today.